Amen. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Vince Stepchuk. I'm part of the teaching team here. And, uh, and I'm glad for that. Having a, a good working knowledge of the Word of God helps all of us. And the study tonight is about tattoos, markings, piercings, body image, modesty. You know, Pastor Giebler, you did that song tonight, Holiness, Holiness, right? And, and what's the word holy mean? You know, I'm, I'm going to jump part way into the study here. But the state of being holy, pure, integrity of moral character, freedom from sin. This is the actual old dictionary definition of the word, you know, when the, you know, closer to the time when the Bible was actually written. And uh, over the years, you know, the dictionary managed to change the definition of quite a few words and uh, use that old dictionary, the 1828. Kevin, I think you brought that up here recently. And uh, it's a useful tool. The, the theme for August is youth and family. Christian challenges and, you know, back to school. And when you put your kids into an environment like that, they're exposed to a lot of things, aren't they? And and if the devil can get a hold of anybody, he wants to get a hold of the kids, right? Part of the reason God destroyed many nations back in the Old Testament, part of the reason he just just utterly destroyed them was because it got to the point where they were corrupting their children. And they couldn't even, you know, they didn't stand a chance. Actually, I think it was an act of mercy just to spare the kids' souls. Because even though they died in the flesh, you know, God's not going to hold somebody accountable for that sin until they're a certain age, that age of understanding. And I think, honestly, it was just to spare the few youth that were there. Otherwise, they would have just grown up to to practice those, those, uh, those ungodly rituals that they were engaged in. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it was uh, part of the theme for the month. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Why does God tell us to think soberly? Because it's our nature to not do that. It's our nature to kind of embellish our own image, right? We like to think a little bit more of ourselves than what we really are. Um, nobody likes being told they're wrong, do they? Show me actually likes how many people like being pointed out wrong. If they do, it's probably because they're seeking God. If somebody wants to know that they're wrong, it means they're they're looking to be better. They're looking to better themselves in some in some meaningful way. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. You know, hey, we've all heard the stories about, you know, you know who your friends are when you're at the lowest point of your life? Well, that kind of goes right along with it. A faithful man who can find. Who can find somebody that's faithful through the good times and the bad? Who can God count on? God said, I will work, and who shall let it? You know, it's our nature to commit sin. It's our nature to pursue the world. And the only way to conquer that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. We have to yield to his way of thinking. And, and I remember this brother shared us something years ago. I'll never forget it. So, some of you might remember his name, uh, Scott Karsten. I'll never forget this statement. He said, if you're a Christian, you won't be mistaken for something else. Right? We're talking about tattoos, markings, piercings, body image, right? How do we present ourselves to people? Is that important as a Christian? Now, this isn't to condemn people that have done these things. You know, there's people out there that'll get, that'll get saved and they're covered all over the body, right? But we're talking about what do you do after you get saved? But, you know, where do we gravitate to? Are we gravitating towards God or are we gravitating towards the world? You know, and uh, Pastor Giebler, yeah, you, you, you stole one of my scriptures, Philippians 4.8. But I can't really say stole it because that was a team study theme for the month. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. It's, it's easy to get caught up in the evil that's in the world, right? The Bible says, what? 
the prince of the power of the air? What's that, what's that mean, the prince of the power of the air? Words, the news, things that we hear, the, the gossip, you know, the gossip that goes around. So many things compete for our attention. So many evil things spoken. So many things that people talk about that are ungodly. And that, you know, what did the Bible say about um, Job? Or not, not Job, Lot. It said he vexed his soul. With the, from day to day with the filthy conversation of the wicked, right? Where, where, was, where was Lot at? Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, if you don't know what that is, <laughs> go look it up. But I think most people that are adults have heard of that. Amen. It's, it's easy to be overwhelmed by all the wickedness that's out there, so we want to keep our mind on good things. You know, if we feed, the Bible says you reap what you sow. If we feed ourselves with... with good, godly things, that's what we will project. And if we feed ourselves with worldly things, that's what we're going to project. We're going to look just like them. And that's not what God wants us to look like, is it? The commandments regarding this subject tonight, tattoos, markings, piercings, body image, modesty. Kevin, again, I'm referring back to something you said here recently. You shared in the Bible study that when God spoke, it wasn't a suggestion that's really a pretty profound statement. God wasn't get, he doesn't guess when he, he doesn't ask you to do something, does he? Like, uh, well, I think it'd be a good idea if you, if you did this, right? Is that the way God talks? No, no God, when Jesus spoke, it, it, people were astonished because he said it's, he spoke as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Amen. Why? Because he was the authority. God sent him down here to be our perfect example and to lead us on a perfect path. And would, would Jesus do anything that was questionable? Would he, you know, these things, would, would Jesus get a tattoo? Obviously not. I don't even think that's up for debate. And, and if it is, your mind is somewhere, it's not in left field, it's in foul territory. Piercings, body image, modesty. The Bible said it, he didn't even have a, an, an, you know, he just had a, a normal appearance, right? How did it say? No beauty or comeliness. So there, there wasn't any, any of that to attract people. And I, I, I saw this thing recently with this Christian singer, how I was talking about his, his image and this and that, and that's what they're trying to project to people, his, his physical image. And I'm like, what's that got to do with worshiping God? Not a thing. Jesus didn't come to bring a, a pretty face to show you who God was. He came, he came to show us what your heart should be like. So getting into some of the commandments that revolve around this subject, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 27 and 28. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. I like the way he caps that statement off, I am the Lord. Again, not a suggestion. Why, why did God tell these people to do this back then? At the time that this commandment was given, the nations that surrounded Israel were making marks on their body for the dead. They were printing marks to show, paying homage to their gods. They're marring the corners of their beard. They do their hair up a certain way. All these things for their idolatry. And it was a straight-up rebellion against the God of Israel, the God that created them, the God of heaven. That's all it was. It was just rebellion. Is that what we want to emulate? No. Even to this day, it's still much that way with the tattoo thing, right? It, you know, many times people get tattoos of deceased relatives and things. Is God the God of the dead or the God of the living? The scripture even says that, doesn't it? He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So he didn't want them making marks on their body for the dead. He didn't want them getting... These images, and they, it's, a, it's a form of idolatry is what it is. And, and who's the idol in this, in this case? It's the individual. They worship themselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, we're speaking about commandments that relate to this subject. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold 
or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And what that's really talking about is, is let the men, let, let the men lead the church, let the men make the decisions, you know, and let the women follow. And uh, does that that goes against what the world teaches, doesn't it? I mean, they're trying to make women pastors. They're trying to, you know, I mean, I, I won't even get into some of the other things they're trying to make pastors out of, <laughs> or leaders or teachers. They, what's our example? Men, to the men in the church, do you want to be a strong representative of Christ? Do you want to show people how it's done to lead the way? Then do it. Then just do it, you know? That, that's, that's something God called us to do as men, is to lead. And, uh, you know, who was it? Deborah? Barak? Right? Yeah, she judged Israel. And, it was a, and, and honestly, I look at that, it, it was a shame to the men because nobody wanted to stand up. Could God make a judge out of a woman? Yeah, he did. But it was a shame to the men. It's like, really? You're going to let... The Bible says the woman was in a transgression first, and that's why God gave men the, to take the lead. And the woman was taken from the man to begin with, right? Man was created in the image of God, and woman was created in the image of man. But we're still both gods. But if you try to change the role that God made you for, you're going against God. You're not going against a church, a pastor. You're not going against me. You can, you know, people can get huffy and and puff out their chest at it, and it's going to be for nothing. <laughs> it is going to be a wasted effort. You're going to lose. <laughs> Nobody in here can fight God. It, I mean, if God made the planet that we're standing on, what can we do to him? Can, can we bend his will? Can we change it? Can we force him? Nothing. We, he, he said it's this way, and it is that way. And that's, and that's fine with me. The, the sooner people learn how to accept that, the sooner they'll find peace. God didn't want us to live a questionable lifestyle. He didn't want us to do things that are questionable so that people would look at us and, and then it all of a sudden mars your testimony. It, 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 it makes people look at you and go, wow, I, I don't know, you do something, something like that. The language that you speak, the way you dress, the way, what we teach, how we act, do I want to, you know, how, how many of us grew up with parents that smoked? And how many of those parents told you not to smoke? Right? That was a big thing over the years, wasn't it? Right? They didn't want to see you get hurt, but you, you still can't get away from the bad example. Can you? Why, why would you want to teach, you know, Ashley, how old are you? 15. Why would you want to teach somebody this age to go out there and get tatted up, or get a nose piercing, or any of this other stuff. They, oh, it's cool. I fit in. Look, look, I look just like the rest of the world. Right, and what's their fate going to be? The whole world, the Bible says, lieth in wickedness. The whole world. And, and then it's just a, a few people that God set aside for salvation because they were willing to take the hard path of not fitting in. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 14, and 15, and, uh, you know, st still touching commandments and things that, re in regards to this topic here, doth not even nature itself teach you? Nature. Can, can nature teach us some things? Right? The Bible said God turned people against their own nature when they chose to ignore him, didn't he? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. And that's a beautiful thing. That's, God gives you this, this thing of beauty as, as your honor, this long hair, this beautiful hair. right? And I get it. Some, some women, you know, can't grow long hair and whatnot. God's not looking down on you because of that. But if you can, you know, stay in line with what God, with, with what God made you. Avoid the confusion. The world, the devil, 
The devil wants us to be confused about every little issue. He wants us arguing about nonsense and things that don't matter. And, and what does the Bible say? Vanity, say it the preacher. All is vanity. It just, it's all a vain show. We want to, instead of presenting the image of God, instead of presenting the image of Jesus Christ to people, we, we, we present ourselves. I give you me. <laughs> right? And what, could, and what can I do for nobody? What can I, what, what can I do for anybody? Nothing. I give, I give you myself. I present to you myself. Right? I can't change one, the color of the hair on your head. I can't heal you. I, I can't deliver your, your grandmother from, from some disease. I can't heal your eyes. I can't heal your throat. You know, all I can do is wake up and punch the clock and go to work like everybody else. Our testimony. How does this? Thing, how do these things affect our testimony? And again, we're talking about tattoos, markings, piercings, body image, and modesty. Second Corinthians six seventeen and eighteen says, "Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Touch not the unclean thing, and the unclean things are the things that the what are the unclean things? The unclean things are the things that the world worships above God, or, the, or, they, or they pursue them in direct opposition to his commandments. Those are the unclean things. You know? And yes, you have to search the scriptures to see what some of those things are, to gain some discernment, to gain some understanding. But if, if our desire is to those things of the world, those unclean things, it compromises our testimony. You think you're going to be effective in trying to bring somebody to Jesus if the only thing that you reflect is the world? No. They'll smile at you and they'll shake their head and say, yeah, that's nice, and then, and then they'll go their merry way. You'll never see them get saved, get baptized. You'll never see them commit. You know, and didn't the Bible say that, that it was God's will that we bear, bear much fruit and that our fruit should remain? That's how it remains, by, by getting closer to God, by by pursuing holiness. That's how we stay in the faith, and that's how we win others to the faith. In Matthew 22, verses 31 and 32, it says, But it's touching the resurrection of the dead, and I spoke about this earlier, have you not read that that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And to this day, all those men that were spoken of here, it says they speak through their testimonies. They, they yet live because they speak through their testimonies like, like Abel. You know, consider Noah. He had to be a complete social outcast prior to the flood, right? Everybody just must have mocked him. You're building a boat out here in the middle, and he's preaching, and he's teaching, and he's sharing. He's like, why? Are, of course people are going to walk up to you and go, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, and you tell them the Lord God told me that he's going to send a flood to destroy the world because of its wickedness. And he said, this is how I'm going to save my family. You know, if you want to come along, you're welcome to. You know, he invited people. He said he was a preacher of righteousness. Of course he wanted people to come along. Don't we want people to come along? If you know God and you know what your fate was, don't you share that with, don't, didn't you share that with your family and other people? James chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? To be a friend of the world, it means to condone their actions. However, you know, instead of making a stand against sin, right, you've not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Why did the scripture say that? Because the apostles did, and they and they all died horrible deaths. And you know what? I really don't want Ohio to die a horrible death. <laughs> Not like that. But you know what? If you stand up for the gospel, you will make enemies. The Bible said you should be hated of all men for my name's sake. Why? Because you're making a stand against the sin, right? The light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. That's supposed to be us. But you can't, you're not shining... 
You're not being a light to the world if you embrace the world and you be a friend to it. And then you tell everybody, oh, yeah, that's great. You got that tattoo? I love it. It's great. You know, go get some more. Right? I saw this YouTube video here recently of this girl. She couldn't find a job. because She was just covered with some really wild-looking tattoos, you know, and the company's concerned about its image. You know, and, of course, they gave her some other excuse other than just saying it was her image because, you know, you get sued or whatever. But, you know, in the back of your mind, almost all of us, you could look at the situation and you know why, right? It's, it's not a mystery. If you've been on this earth for a few years and you've got a little experience under your belt, it's not a mystery why some people, you know, why they end up making themselves an outcast in society and not in a good way. You know, I'm, I'm so different. I'm, I'm going to make myself so different, and, and you have to accept me. Actually, I don't, you know. I, I have friends over the years. I have friends that have... Uh, you know, they've been drug addicts, they've been this, they've been that. I don't hang out with them and spend time with them. I don't do the things they do. I don't want it to rub, I don't, I don't want the habits to rub off of me. But, I, but yet they can come to me and talk and ask me to pray, ask for advice. You know, I might go out and grab a bite to eat with them as long as they respect me as a Christian. And if they don't, and if they choose not to respect me as a Christian, that's when our time together comes to an end. I had a friend here, he, he died about a couple years ago, and for some reason, this guy had a, a wild and crazy lifestyle, and for some reason he just gravitated towards me in the last year of his life so much, and I was just thinking, wow, I was like, he says, you know, he, he was an atheist, and yeah, he's, he says to me, Vinny, I think people like you are necessary, you know, like Christians, and, uh, you know, and he just liked the fact that I stood for something, and I, I and I, and I tried to be consistent with it, and, and, he, and he took note of that, and uh, right up to the end. And he would invite, you know, he'd invite me out for some events that would normally turn into some wild event, and it, it got real tame, and it got real uh, tempered, just out of respect. And it just, it just really kind of shook me up. I, just, I was just kind of surprised, you know at how that friendship developed. And you'll know, if, some, if you're having an, an effect on somebody, that you'll know, they respect you. They'll respect, your, they'll respect the things that you stand for. And then there's some people that will just outright hate it and not want to do it, and they'll, they'll mock and they'll make fun. Okay, fine, you can distance yourself from them. You don't have to make enemies out of them. You know, they're making an enemy out of you, but you don't have to make an enemy out of them. still want to be there for them if they ever do come knocking on the door asking for the answers. You know, the Bible says, take heed lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There, a lot of little things can trouble us as Christians and compromise our testimony in the eyes of the world, our language, our manner of speaking, your fears, right? Everybody's like, oh, the election's coming up. Well, what's that going to do for you? Right? Can God keep you in the midst of this situation or not? regardless of which way it goes. Hey, who's your faith in? The, the government or God? Cursed be the man that trusteth the man that maketh flesh his arm and his heart departeth from the Lord. We have to trust God. And we have to project that to other people. We have to show people we trust God and that we have peace in that. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, a few of us heard the scripture time and time and time again when we first got saved. And now I know it was for good reason. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And to love the world just means to put it before God. Instead of using it, you abuse it. And you let it abuse you. You know, and and I think all of us have experienced that. You know, we've we've abused and we've been abused at some point or time. You know, how many of us have done things over the course of our life that are hurtful to ourselves? Right? Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Shouldn't have done this. Oh, I got that tattoo. And then my neighbor across the street, you know, he had a couple from the army, and man, he was just really just around me and my brothers, and my you know my mom, 
he was just really ashamed to have that thing exposed. <laughs> and he was talking about getting rid of it and this and that. You know, it just, it just bothered him, you know. And, you know, I would say rightfully so because it's just one of those things you look back at. You don't have to condemn yourself over it. It's not a, it's not a matter of, oh, it's going to put you in hell. God said, don't put these marks on your body. He said, you know, don't, don't go the way of idolatry. Don't worship yourself above God. And, and people, they do these things, and then they look back at it over the years of their life with regret. You know, and, and the younger people should learn from that. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I had learned some lessons. You know, I wish I had just learned to work harder when I was younger. I'll say that one. There, there's one, right? Just being lazy. Well, you're not lazy, Vince. I'm lazy. Lazier than I should have been at times. I try, I, I work hard now, but there's been, there was times when I was just, I just wish I had been more clearly defined goals when it came to work or when it came to life, you know, and we all have some sort of regrets that are like along those lines, you know, where you wish you did something good where you did something bad and, and you look back at it with regret. And it's, it's not a point of condemnation. It's just a point of learning. And it's a point of teaching because if, if somebody does something, if, if they abuse their body, if they tat it all up and they, nose piercings and rings and all this other stuff, you know, you're not supposed to glorify those things. You know, what, what, what do I do now that I've got all these things on me? You know, or I made the mistake of getting it after I got baptized, right? Well, you just, you don't, it doesn't have to become a conversation piece every time you have, you have a conversation with somebody, but it's not something to glorify either, you know? Just treat it like, like it is. God said not to do it, you know, and I went and did it, and it's like, eh, kind of look back with it and wish I didn't do it, but, you know. And, and, and you're not going to look like the world. You're not going to present yourself to the world and take on all these worldly attributes and then say, oh, well, it helps me to relate to the world better. That's, that's not the idea. The Bible said come out from among them and be separate, say God, and touch not the unclean thing. And then... God will receive you. And then God will receive me. First Timothy, or Second Timothy, chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some dis to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he should be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. We also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. If you want to be effective as a Christian, then, then clean it up. You know, I mean, it, it, it sounds, we overcomplicate it when we get our head, when we get our head stuck on ourselves and we get our head stuck on our fears. Oh, well, you know, I really want this thing. And your, and your lust drives you to do this thing that is not godly or you know it's not holy. You know it's not pure, right? The Bible says whatsoever, thing, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I don't know if anybody ever got a tattoo out of faith. I know a lot of people that look for a way to justify it after they did it. And like I said, this is not to try to condemn people that have done these things before, but it's all about what kind of image do you present to the world as a Christian? You know, and some of us that are older, not, not, now that I'm get, getting up there in years, we don't wrestle maybe with those same youthful lusts that we once did. They don't mean anything. Some, some, some of the things that had such a draw on us as we, when we were younger don't have such a draw on us anymore. Now the only thing we fight is uh, old age and bitterness. And, uh, and that's a real thing, right? You get jaded, and you, expect, and you expect certain things of people. You expect certain things of the world, and it doesn't come, and you just find yourself getting angry, and it's like, all right, God, help me calm down. You know, and that, and that becomes a vice for us. You know, what, what should the elder be teaching the younger? How to avoid these pitfalls of life. How to avoid these things. Don't, you know, don't, don't put a mark on your body that's going to last you the rest of your life, and then you're going to look back at it with regret. When you, when you come to realize that it compromises you as a Christian, if you take that seriously. John chapter 10, verse 10. 
The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You know, the devil wants us to think that our life consists of worldly trappings and all these things that surround us, right? You know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Now, he who dies with the most toys still dies. I heard it said like that. You know, outdo your neighbor. Jesus told us to put away those foolish things and draw closer to him. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's what Jesus said. That's where life is. That's where peace is. That's where our testimony will have the greatest impact. How does this affect our, our relationship with God? We, we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers. Lord, heal my parents, my daughter, my son, or there's some serious matter that we've got going on in our lives, and, and we wonder why God doesn't listen, or we keep praying for the same thing over and over, and, and the answer never comes. And, and sometimes people say, well, it's, it's, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. And yet it's a good thing you're praying for, but you just don't see the answer come. And it's like, why? You know, why don't I see my children delivered? Why don't I see this happen? Why don't I see that happen? You know, you're praying for good things, right? Things that you would think would be in the will of God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 4. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's to the children of Israel. That's not to the world, right? That's to the children of Israel. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongues have muttered perverseness. What's perverse? When you tell somebody to go do something that's ungodly and, and then praise it, that's perverse. And that's something God doesn't want us to do to our youth. Don't pervert the children. You will get on God's bad side. If you try to justify things in your life that you've done that are wrong, if I try to justify things that I've done in my life that are wrong before my children, that's, a good way, that, that, that's an easy way to get on God's bad side. Won't hear your prayers. May very, well let you, uh, may very well lift up the hedge and let the devil abuse you a little bit just to get your attention. Like the way he cursed Israel, right? He said, if you do all these things, you'll be blessed in the field, blessed out here, you'll be blessed out there. And if you don't do these things, You'll be cursed in the field and cursed out here and cursed out there. If we try to justify the things in our lives that clearly contradict the scriptures, it should be easy to understand why God wouldn't answer our prayers. Song of Solomon 2.15. We're talking about our relationship with God. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. And it's, it's not the big sins that take Christians down the path of decline, right? What, what does Scripture talk about? Like, you know, when you become unfruitful, right? The cares of this life, they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Parable of the sower. It's these little things. It's this combination of little things that seem meaningless, ignoring the small things that God wants us to pay attention to. You know, <clears throat> if you're conscientious about your work, you pay attention to the details, right? And it's, it's reflected in your work performance. And it's reflected in the outcome uh, of, of your efforts. You know, you bring forth a good product or whatever it is, right? You can tell when, when a carpenter, when he builds a house and he really takes pride in his work. They're like, man, look at that. You know, look, look at these seams, look at these joints, look at these windows. Look, It's not howling, it's not creaking, it's not squeaking. Everything fits, it looks nice. Um, Bob Hertzler and I, we went out to, the, out to New Hampshire coming back from visiting his, his family. And then uh, we stopped by the Mount Washington Hotel out in uh, New Hampshire. And as soon as you saw it, it was just breathtaking. I was like, wow. I said, somebody was really thinking ahead when they built this place. And just They wanted it to look cl as classy as could be using the mountain as a backdrop. You know, they put some serious effort into this thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it's the last scripture. Talking about our relationship with God, and, and again, you know, the study tonight is about tattoos, markings, piercings, body image, modesty, how these things affect us, how they affect our testimony, how it affects our relationship with God. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness, it means to walk away from the world and its influences, 
and walk towards God. And that will strengthen our relationship with God. It will make our prayers more effective. And it will allow us to influence others to draw nigh to God. God bless you and thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>